And I think leaning in as an interviewer in t- when you're talking to people needs to be done with with, uh, with tact. You don't want to just always like, you know, bloody always lean in and... oh. Well, hello and a warm welcome. It's Dr. Sil here. I'm a junior doctor from Australia on the Psychiatry Training Program. And today we're going to do a reaction to uh, some vintage footage, some old school uh, footage on YouTube called Simple Schizophrenia. This video has amassed uh, over 3 million views and it depicts a young lady with, I'm guessing, schizophrenia. We can talk about the signs and symptoms that she um, reports and I can also reflect on my experience managing schizophrenia in hospital because that is a very common cause for for hospitalizations in mental health units. If you're new to the channel, I just wanted to say a warm welcome. All right, let's get into the video. There's a characteristic lack of interest in the environment, withdrawal from contact with others, and with it, goes an increasing loss of emotional response. These people become vague and empty. Their manner is childish and they are gawky. They show little or no initiative and spontaneity. If they do react emotionally, their reaction is often inappropriate. They have, of course, no real plans for the future. In spite of this general impoverishment of their personality, many of their intellectual functions remain intact memory and orientation are not impaired. The patient we are going to see is about 40. She has been sick for more than 10 years, lives quietly in the hospital, doing simple work in the laundry. She seldom speaks unless spoken to and does not mix with the other patients. But she is really quite contented and her lack of energy and animation is not due to depression and despondency but to apathy. She might, during the interview, demonstrate an appropriate emotional reaction, particularly smiling or laughing when discussing serious subjects. She complains of auditory hallucinations, voices, and strange feelings of being controlled by unseen forces, though these are not especially common symptoms in the simple type of schizophrenia. Look, I'll just pause there because he just spoke about lots of things that are worth having a bit of context to the first part of what he was saying is um, he was discussing negative symptoms of psychosis, which is a really important um, kind of area of symptomatology in, in psychotic illness, because when you think of psychosis and you think of schizophrenia, you think of really what you you imagine are the positive symptoms, um, which are the group of symptoms, which include hallucinations, hearing voices and responding to those voices, people talking to unseen stimuli. Uh, they involve delusions, believing that people are following you and chasing you and, and that there are, you know, people that are out to get you. Those are persecutory delusions. There's lots of other types of delusions, grandiose, erotomatic, um, lots of them. Uh, and so that's really what comes to mind in the general population when we think about psychosis. But what he's talking about is actually a very, not only common set of symptoms, but the most difficult to treat. Um, and they come from a, we think a dysfunction, the uh, mesocortical tracts. Uh, and, and these are the negative symptoms of psychosis. These are things like a motivation, like a, a, not, a, not a depression, but an, a lack of motivation to do things and to, you know, to, to achieve goals uh, or to even set goals. Um, a logia, a, a p- impoverishment of quantity of thought. So there's just lack of things coming out. It's the, the thought process is, is slow and delayed. And, um, and the other thing he talked about was anhedonia, like a lack of, um, you know, d- d- deep enjoyment of things. Uh, and he makes the point to say it's not because of depression, it's because of uh, the impoverishment that comes with psychosis. And that's right giving these people an antidepressant and doing CBT to treat the depression wouldn't change their symptoms of psychosis. But it's important to remember people can have psychosis and be depressed. And so you do have to do a very thorough assessment to work out what are the causes of these negative symptoms. Now, the final point to say is there is, um, he's describing incongruent uh, emotional responses. So talking about serious things and laughing, um, uh, you know, affective lability and incongruency. Affective means the kind of emotions that someone is expressing. Uh, that That's very common in, in schizophrenia. And how long have you been here? I, I think uh, it might be 14 months in the, uh, December. Beginning of this time. In this place? Yeah. You like it here? Yeah, I like it when it's quiet. You like it when it's quiet? 
I find it too noisy to hold a patient. Sometimes it's noisy here because of the other patients. Mm, probably. Why do you like it better when it's quiet? Have you always liked it quiet or? I've been used to living where it's quiet. Except for the railway. You told me once that you didn't like the radio. Yes. In the hospital. I was unhappy when they brought the radio. Why? It, the ward was quieter without it. Well, if you're very quiet, what are you doing? Are you reading or are you thinking? I'm not reading either. You don't like reading? What are you doing? Just a couple of observations, and actually I, I, the observations I have are for the interviewing technique, and um, I, you can tell pretty quickly this guy's a compassionate, kind interviewer. I think, um, uh, you know, he starts with open questions, but she, she's, uh, you know, it's either, I don't know, I don't think guarded is the right word. I think it's just um, probably the, the negative symptoms of psychosis makes it hard to answer big open-ended questions. Um, but uh, so he, he, he starts with open questions, um, like what, what do you do when, you know, when you're not, you know, what do you do in your free time? I forgot how he worded it. Um, but obviously she, she's struggling to answer those questions. So then he gives examples. Are you reading? Are you, you know, are you, are you doing other activities? So that's a common technique in interviewing where you start with an open-ended question, you see how they go. Um, often if people are in emotional distress or, or psychotic or whatever, uh, it can be hard to like answer a big open-ended question. So then you can give uh, more kind of yes, no, close-ended questions. The other thing to say is... Um, Body language, um, you know, she's a little bit kind of closed off and down, downward gaze, and she, she's obviously quite a fra uh, I don't know, if fragile is the right word. She's, she's she seems quiet and introverted, um, and and he he's kind of. Uh, uh, I just think he's probably sitting a bit close when I look at this image. Um, you know, they're, they're almost knee to knee. Uh, and maybe that's because of the camera set up and, and, and back in the day they had to set the room up. But it looks like a bigger room uh, and, and that he's quite like he's leaning in uh, almost into her space. And I think um, people like this probably just need a bit of space. Um, and, and, I, and I think leaning in as an interviewer in when you're talking to people needs to be done with... with uh, with tact you don't want to just always like you know bloody always lean in and oh you know it can, it can be intense um but it, if done if done well it can show empathy and uh like you, you know you're trying to connect with them so it can show uh a kind of non-verbal body language sense of caring um but if it's done too much uh, uh it, it can be a problem i think music better listening to music and not talking you like that? The music is the best, I think. Vera, you told me another time that sometimes you hear voices talking to you, can't see the people. Does that happen often? Yes, I think it's all day. All day? I, yes, I, I don't think I have, my head's ever been free of anybody talking. Can you hear them now? Since I was a young girl. Can you hear them now? Well, we'll be quiet. And I can talk, huh? And I can talk without them. You can talk without whom? They take away my talking. The voices? Yes. How do they do it? So that was another symptom that was brought up earlier, um, passivity phenomena. Uh, that, that's, that's a psychotic symptom where people feel like their body is being um, controlled by an external force. Uh, and th the ways that they describe how it's happening can, can be delusional explanations for this uh, psychotic symptom that they're not in control of their body. Um, but it can be dangerous uh, if you feel someone else is controlling your body, plus you're getting voices telling you to hurt others. It's a very bad recipe. Uh, that's not what's happening here, but it's just an important thing to be aware of. Now, when asking about voices, look, just as a quick point about auditory hallucinations, uh, you know, 3% of people 
in, in the general population also get voices and aren't psychotic. So it's not because that someone hears voices that they have psychosis full stop. Psychosis is a bigger picture thing. You have to look at lots of, you know, their, their cognitive organization, their life, their, you know, how it changes with rapport in different people. You know, if uh, voices can happen as a result of trauma or as a result of psychosis or, or as a normal variant. So, um, you know, people are sometimes very quickly to label someone with psychosis just because they're hearing voices but it's it's more complex than that and it's more multifactorial than that it's it's not just one symptom um obviously in in this case uh that there's other types of symptoms that lead to the diagnosis of psychosis the fact that she can fold laundry all day and be contented and there's a lack of um volition a lack of motivation and a lack of cognition and um uh and the other symptoms that he talked about but the passivity as well adds into that now, with passivity, just make sure you've got to differentiate it from uh, depersonalization and derealization, which are not necessarily psychotic symptoms. So depersonalization, derealization, these are uh, symptoms that people can experience as a result of dissociative disorders and stress disorders and trauma disorders. And um, they're really the symptoms of feeling like you're not in your body, like you're floating above yourself, like, you're, like the reality isn't real, like you're in a video game, like you're watching yourself just play a video game. Um, and, uh, and we can talk about more about that in another video. Can you tell me what they're saying? I don't, I don't pay any attention to what they say. But you understand them. Why did you come here, Vera? Are you still sick? No, I'm much better now. So um, just because they moved on to the next point, I'll just make the point to say when you're asking about voices, uh, it can be tricky, especially if people don't want to talk about them and you've got to respect people's you know, um, rights to not talk about what they don't want to talk about. Uh, and, uh, but, but if you can, you want to elicit some pretty important points. First of all, you want to know, um, uh, I guess, uh, uh, w w the content, you know, are, is, are they telling you to do things which can happen in schizophrenia or are they just commentating on what you're doing, which can also happen in schizophrenia? Um, because if they're telling you to hurt people and you're feeling like you're losing control or like you have to listen to them, if not, they'll kill your mum or something. Uh, well, then you're, you're more likely to do what they're say, telling you to do, which often involves hurting yourself or others, uh, when it, and, and those are called command hallucinations. Um, but in, in more general terms, it's good to know how many voices there are. Do you know who the voices are? Do they sound like they're inside your head or outside in the room? Uh, why can you hear them but I can't? Or do you think that I can hear them and I'm lying? These are kind of uh, interesting questions. The publicness of the voices I always find interesting. Um, and it can be very difficult to, to, to divide psychotic voices from uh, post-trauma voices. But again, when you take it with the whole picture, usually you can uh, come to a diagnosis. And, and that's my job, you know, that's, that's the job of the psychiatrist. It's to, uh, and I'm a psychiatrist in training, you know, I'm, a, I'm the training pathway, but that will be my job. And yeah, it's not easy, but you've got to do it. Also, guys, as a side note, if you're enjoying this video, please do what I'm about to do. Go down and give it a like. Would you like staying here? Have you seen your family lately? No, I haven't. Well, aren't you feeling lonesome? Yes, I was wishing I had a visitor. They haven't seen you for a long time? No. Have you written them? No, I haven't. I don't like writing letters. Okay, well, th there we go. We, we saw um, evidence of incongruent emotional responses. You know, she's talking about how she's lonesome and she, she misses her family. And you, you just glimpsed it for a second there, but she gave a big smile and a giggle and caught herself off and, and then uh, went back to answering the question seriously. Um, so that is dysfunctional neural processes happening in the brain, uh, you know, incongruent with you can just imagine the brain is disorganized, right? It's not a normal emotional response. It's kind of out of control emotional response. And this can happen in schizophrenia. It can also happen in other neurological disorders, right? Um, and the famous kind of, uh, the famous example of that is in the Joker, where the, the Joker has pseudobulbar affect due, and, you know, that can happen as a result of brain injuries or strokes or, and that's essentially pathological laughter, well, laughing when you, you shouldn't be laughing. But so those are kind of the organic neurological causes, but also can happen happen in a psychotic illness. Did they write you? No, I didn't have any, receive any letters either. I 
I think you might have a visit soon. Oh, possibly if I'm good. That was an interesting, almost childlike response. You know, she's 40 years old and saying she might get a visit if she's good. Uh, that, that's inconsistent with her age. So um, that childlike affect, you can see that in, in psychotic illnesses. It's almost a regression of sorts. I think the other comment to make here is managing chronic mental illness. Like, uh, she's obviously in an, in an asylum, you know. Asylums were quite common up until the 80s, I think, and um, they involved long-term, lifelong sometimes, uh, psychiatric admissions for chronic mental illness. And obviously this asylum was a nice one, but some of them were horrible and it's very... Uh, kind of, there's a lot of horror stories from asylums, and and uh, you know psychiatry has come a long way, but the current management is to have people in the community managed in households with support workers from. In Australia, we have the NDIS, a National Disability Insurance Scheme, that provides support workers, and sometimes they live in a house with 24/7 carers and support, uh, and so the goal is to keep people in the community. Um, and I think that's, uh, you know, generally the right thing. But there are exceptions that I think would benefit from asylum style hospitals that are much more ethical than they used to be, you know, with much higher level standards of care. Um, there, are, there are just people who really struggle to be in the community and benefit from the containment of a institution and sometimes and, and want it you know I, I've got a couple of patients I've seen who want to be in hospital 24 7 for the rest of their life because the community well there's just a lot of drugs uh, really it's always around drugs now I think about it and and when they're in the community they just can't control themselves and they end up doing drugs and their life turns to crap so um, yeah they, they, they want to be in hospital to, to kind of contain their their impulsive behaviors you know what day it is today? Thursday. You know what time it is about? No, I have to tell. That's quite right. Ten minutes past twelve. Did you see the paper today? No, I haven't. Why not? Don't like reading? I like magazines. I hate magazines. See my head up there? Hmm? See my head up there? What my head? head goes up there when I'm quiet. Where's it going? Where I talk. Where's your head going? I would say she seems distracted, right? So she's having internal experiences uh, and and kind of looking around the room and the, on the floor, and and probably she's she's got a couple of voices happening at the moment, and she's struggling to to hear which voices are the real one from the interviewer versus the, f the well the, the the auditory hallucinations, um, and that can be really hard for a patient. Uh, sometimes you just need to you know outdo the voices and, and compete with them and, and and so i remember one patient who who wouldn't drink water or, or eat food because the voices were telling him not to but if the nursing staff like three of them just said like drink some water drink some water drink some water and and would like encourage him they would be louder than the voices and he would drink water um, but it was a really bad situation. I had to call a code blue actually because he's, um, his blood pressure was so low because he hadn't drunk for, for days. Um, and then we get, and then I, so I quickly gave him a, a liter of uh, intravenous fluids and it kept going down. And I was like, well, this is all I can do on a, on, on a psychiatric ward. So I called the code blue and, and put, you know, I did my kind of emergency response for low blood pressure, which is a pretty standardized protocol. And he ended up going to um, yeah, I see you and, and getting uh, fluid resuscitated and then he came back to the ward and, uh, and as the psychosis improved, he ate and he drank more and it was good in the end. What would you like to do now, Vera? I was playing the piano. I, I was enjoying playing the piano for a few minutes. And afterwards, what are you going to do next year? I'd like to play the piano next year. Yeah, there's a lack well, of suppose, um, 
just for a minute, that you were to have a hundred thousand dollars. Yes. What would you do with it? Hospital needed it. The hospital needed it? Mm-hmm. You mean you would give it to the hospital? Probably. And what would you do? I'd like them to keep me here. <laughs> I need you to keep you here. Yeah. Because you like it here. How do you feel? I'm feeling better, thank you. Feeling better? Are you sleeping well? Yes, I'm sleeping better now. How's your appetite? You must be feeling very lonesome, being alone so long. Are you? Yes, I was lonely, yes. Hmm. Why are you smiling? Have you any friends here? Yes, I have friends here. Are you seeing them every day? Yes, I think so. And what do you do? Do you talk to them? When, when I'm out here. You're always allowed to, you know. Oh, yes. That would have been interesting to ask if what she meant by it when I'm allowed to. Are the voices telling her that she can't do it or... Um, you know, yeah. What, what's is there a delusional process there? Because although we've noted she's got hallucinations, passivity, negative symptoms, we haven't actually talked much about delusions and false beliefs. And um, you know, she hasn't disclosed any alien or conspiracy theory stuff. So it would have been interesting to talk through that. And what would you like to do now? Maybe it's time to go back for for lunch. Huh? You just had your lunch. How yeah. long ago? Half an hour. Half an hour. Are you hungry again? No. Well, let's go anyway. Perhaps we get a cup of coffee. Yes. Yeah. All right. Very interesting. And I just said that's interesting at the end there because she got up quite quickly. It's, it's, it's just important to like see how people, how quickly people stand up, you know, because you want to see if they're catatonic or, or whatever it is. And, um, and, and, and psychosis can manifest physically and, and cause, uh, you know, uh, catatonia and stiffness and, and uh, lots of other interesting symptoms. But we won't go into catatonia right now. Well, that was a, a fascinating uh, interview with a patient um, who showed signs of that kind of emotional um, inappropriateness, uh, the, the apathy, the negative symptoms, uh, some of the positive symptoms, the auditory hallucinations. Um, but the intact kind of cognitions around uh, uh, orientation. I'm really grateful to the patient and doctor for making that content uh, those 70 years ago um, and uh, it's, it's still very helpful to this day. Um, you know, sometimes these symptoms are hard to see because people are treated well now, uh, so you don't you don't get the, the the same intensity of symptoms because we have more treatments. Um, that being said, some people with chronic psychotic illness do have really bad uh, treatment resistant kind of diseases, and it can be really hard to treat them. And so you do see some really disabling symptoms in the in the hospitals. Other than that, that's that's kind of all I wanted to talk about. If you found it interesting or helpful, please consider subscribing to the channel. I'd absolutely love to have you join the gang. Um, and uh, liking the video is the best way you can help the, the channel grow. If you want to leave a comment down below to any other footage or music videos or you know whatever you think would be interesting for me to react to, please do. Um, I'd look at all the comments. I look at all the re, uh, kind of recommendations uh, for reactions and, and I react to them. So, so please leave comments down below. And other than that, I wish you all just a wonderful day full of love and connection. And I'll see you all in the next video. All right. Bye for now.